What happened with the teleprompter, man? <laughs> hey, he's a little late, right? <laughs> oh, well. I had nothing to do with it. Well, uh, first, let me thank you for uh, speaking with us today. Uh, I think uh, many of us found your economic plan very bold and ambitious. Thank you. I was talking with uh, Marty Feldstein, uh, excuse me, with uh, uh, Glenn Hubbard, who's the uh, dean of the uh, Columbia Business School. It's a big difference. And, uh, you know, we we're talking about how many economists have resigned themselves to a low growth, one and a half, two percent range for the U.S. You believe with your economic policies, we can grow three and a half percent plus. Could you summarize the key components sure. of that plan and, and if, if possible, quantify the contribution to the increased growth? Certainly. I think that um, I watch the world and I look at China and other countries. And if China goes down with GDP to 7% or even 8%, it's like they'll have a revolution. And then what do they do? They start devaluing, devaluing. They do all sorts of things, and they get it back on track one way or the other. And I've had friends come to me that have been devastated, people that are manufacturers, that are great manufacturers, very successful people, but they become less and less successful because they can't beat the system. In this way, too, it's a rigged system. And they're almost doing well, and then, boom, there's a massive devaluation in China or other countries. Uh, and there are plenty of other countries out there, and some are actually hurting China now. But the fact is that when they have 7%, and you see it where they start dropping to 7 or 8%, they consider that to be a disaster, and yet we're stuck at 1%. Probably the real number is 1%, but certainly no more than 2%, and we try and learn to live with it. We can't do that anymore. So we're going to uh, unleash uh, tremendous opportunity. And we're bringing back the trillions of dollars that doesn't come into this country. And that does really, I said it uh, in my remarks, uh, that does really bring a lot of companies out. They go to get their money. They leave, not even because taxes are too high. They leave to get their money. So we're going to unleash a lot. We're going to unleash a lot with the regulations. I'll tell you, the, the thing that most surprised me in going around, because I've been to, I mean, I've been everywhere. I have been working. This started on June 16th. Who knew this was going to happen, right? But it started on June 16th, and it's been an amazing thing. But what's really amazed me from a business standpoint, I speak to big businesses, the biggest businesses in the world, but I also speak to the small business people and the farmers. And if they had their choice between this massive tax cut from 35% down to 15 or regulation relief, they would take almost 100% of the time regulation relief. The regulations are a disaster. They're killing people. They're killing the farmers. They're killing the energy folks. They're killed. They've killed the mines. But they're ki and you know, we all believe there has to be regulation for safety, for environment, for certain reasons. But it has gone so crazy and it's gotten so excessive. But they would take that over taxes. So we're going to unleash a tremendous number of jobs coming in. Plus, we're going to have great, ta great cutting. Waste, fraud, abuse. But think of that word waste. I mean, with the penny plan, just a penny out of every dollar. Now, I know you can do that very easily, but we have to appoint people to head these massive, massive agencies. You know, if they were companies, they'd be very large companies. They'd be up there with the biggest. Some would be bigger than any of the companies. But you take a penny, a penny off the dollar, and you do that for a number of years, and all of a sudden, really great things start to happen. In addition to that, we spend a tremendous amount on military, which we're going to increase. We have no choice. But we also defend other countries. And those countries are not paying us nearly what they should be paying us. We're losing tremendous billions and billions of dollars on defending other people, some of whom don't even appreciate the fact that we're defending them. And many of them don't pay us. They don't pay us. And they don't pay us, I say, why? Because, you know, they don't ask. We don't ask. So those countries, I'm sure, will start to pay for the defense. But it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic number. It's a very, very large, uh, it's, it's a shocking number. It's a shocking number. I, I will just finish with saying this. I have great respect for Japan. 
But as you know, we defend Japan, we defend Germany, we defend Saudi Arabia, we defend South Korea. We have 28,000 uh, soldiers right now, South Korea. These are economic behemoths, behemoths. These are wealthy countries. And when I said they have to pay more, a general came to refute my statement and said, doesn't Mr. Trump know that Japan pays 50% of the cost of its defense? And I said, ah, oh, why don't they pay 100%? <laughs> the numbers you're talking about are massive. And when you add it all together, a lot of good things are going to happen. Thank you. <laughs> On the corporate tax rate, a cornerstone of your economic policy is reducing the corporate tax rate to 15%. Secretary of the Treasury Liu proposed a 28 percent rate. The UK is at 20 percent, and Ireland is at 12.5 percent. How did you settle on 15 percent as a target for the US? Well, a lot of that has to do with the cutting, because we're going to be cutting costs also. As part of our tax plan, we have to cut costs. Uh, but I think we're going to unleash something that's going to be so amazing, and a lot of it's competition. Uh, you look at Ireland being just about the lowest, a little bit lower. So we're not the lowest, but we're getting down there. But right now, essentially, we're the highest in the world, certainly, of the industrialized countries. And we uh, set it from a competitive standpoint, and we added to that, and very importantly added to that, the cutting, the cost cutting. And there's tremendous fat. You know, it's interesting when all of us, and so many in the room do this, but when we buy companies, we like to buy companies that are poorly run. Right? Because we can have so much room to cut. We don't want to buy a perfectly running machine where we can't do too much, right? Well, we're not a perfectly running machine. We have tremendous waste, tremendous fraud, tremendous abuse. Our military orders equipment that, uh, frankly, it's ordered, I say, politically motivated because they'll buy equipment that's not as good as the equipment they want and the equipment that they want, the generals want, is it's better and it's less expensive. But we have so many things we can do if we do it properly. And, you know, my whole theme has been make America great again. We're going to make America great again. Mm. Now it's uh, time for Martin Feldstein, who's also on our board and he's chairman of the uh, Department of Economics at Harvard. Uh, part of the issue in reducing tax rates is the impact on the deficit. So what offsets would you propose to compensate for the reduced revenue? You mentioned in your speech that you believe over time your economic policy can be revenue neutral? Well, eventually, and I, we, we think, uh, and hopefully beyond that, eventually, uh, with time, this is going to work out, absolutely. But the big things in terms of neutrality is going to be the amount of business that we generate, the fact that companies are no longer going to be leaving. I mean, you have to look at the list of companies. I, I told you uh, just before that Ford Motor Company, this is a massive amount of business they're taking their small car all small cars they're going to make them in mexico it's like you know it's a story in a newspaper but it's devastating for michigan and areas of the country that have to go through this we're going to keep our country companies here our companies are leaving us because taxes are so high our companies are leaving us because they can't bring their money back in our companies are leaving us because of regulation the regulation is so massive that our companies are leaving us. So I think we're going to, number one, we're going to keep companies here. They're not going to be leaving anymore because now they're going to have a better deal than where they're looking to go. But importantly, we're also coupling that with cutting costs, uh, cutting budgetary costs and lots of costs. There will be many costs that we're going to be cutting. And we're going to be enhanced by certain things like out with the military and the defense of other countries, which a lot of people didn't even know. I don't think too many people even in this room, until I started speaking about it a year ago, I don't think a lot of people knew that we defend, as an example, Germany or Japan. You pretty much knew South Korea, and we're defending South Korea. Uh, but, you know, Saudi Arabia, as an example, Saudi Arabia we know, lots of wealth, lots of money. They don't pay us very much for what we do. And you know, you could ask yourself, how long would Saudi Arabia even be there if we weren't defending them? And I, I think we should defend them, but we have, to, we have to be compensated properly for that defense. I'm sure they'll be thrilled to hear that. 
Well, one issue that came be up be uh, previously uh, was the uh, was the potential for default on the uh, U.S. debt. So you know, the U.S. has a uh, perfect credit history. Is there any scenario you would consider defaulting on the U.S. debt? No. No. Uh, there are scenarios where you could buy back debt. I don't know. Somebody put that out. I said buy back debt. You know, this isn't like you're building a real estate project and the market crashes and you have your shot at a bank. I love those days, you know? I love that. <laughs> Somebody said I'm one of the great in the world at that. I love back, you know, I love buying back debt. I love negotiating debt. But with the United States, you're talking about something beyond a gold standard. No, the answer is no. But you can buy back. We're not talking at discounts. You can discount. You can do things. But no, the, the debt of this country is absolutely sacred. Absolutely 100% sacred. You have to do it. Uh, regarding regulation, uh, in, you, you said that we have too much regulation and that excess regulation impedes growth. What would be your strategy for reducing excessive regulation? Well, I go back to the heads of the various groups, agencies, uh, you know, all of the different parcels of government, and I would be putting very, very uh, top people in to negotiate. We don't do that. We put Honestly, we put political people in to negotiate. We put people that uh, gave contributions. We put people that, you know, work the system. We put people that shouldn't be there. And when you say, can you cut 1% off your budget, they look like this is impossible. Whereas people in this room, because I know a couple of them, they're total killers. I won't, mention, I won't call them out. They hear 1%. They say, Don, I can do it all in one year. I can get it down 25% in one year, maybe more. I say, take it easy. Just relax. But... <laughs> But there are people in this room that would say that. So, you know, when you hear 1% a year for 10 years, it's a massive difference. But 1% a year for 10 years. So I would really have it done at the level of the group running whatever individual thing within government they're running. And they'll be able to do it if we have the right people. We don't have the right people. We have people that shouldn't be doing what they're doing. We have people that have people under them that are far, far more competent than they are. And they lose, those people lose respect for the system when they see what's coming in. A and I can't tell you how strongly I believe this. Uh, the trade deals are so bad. NAFTA has destroyed our country. NAFTA has destroyed the manufacturing leg of our country. You look at places upstate New York where they lost 40% of their manufacturing, and they're going to lose a lot more. Before it's out. Don't forget, Hillary Clinton said when she was running for the Senate, she's going to bring jobs back to New York. She meant New York State, but New York. Upstate New York, out on Long Island. You look at things that are happening, it's unbelievable. Building after building that's empty. She didn't bring any. They, they left. They all left. So when we negotiate great trade deals, that will, and we're not even including that to a large extent in the numbers that we're giving you, but when we take NAFTA and make it a two way highway, not a one way, so that, yes, Things go out, but we have at least equal, and I mean at least because we have a lot of catching up to do. They have absolutely stripped this country of its manufacturing jobs and jobs. And companies, they've destroyed companies. Thousands and thousands of companies, millions of jobs. We're going to get that back. We're going to get that back. So whenever I talk about tax cutting and I talk about uh, balancing, a big part of it is going to be we're going to have great trade deals. He would be a man to negotiate. I think I'll put him in charge of China. <laughs> and you know what? We'll do very well. Just put him in the room for a few days. We'll do very well. But seriously, we have to use our... We have the greatest negotiators in the world. We have to use. When China enters that negotiation, they come in with 20 people that are the toughest, smartest, meanest. They don't say good morning. Isn't it a lovely day? Isn't it wonderful how the Yankees do last night? There's no talk. It's like we get down to business. Boom. No games. We put people in there that don't know what they're doing. Because this is why we have deficits of $500 billion with one country. We rebuilt China. And I say that with respect for China. I have a great relationship with China. They used to tell me before I announced I was running, that they can't, I have many friends from China, the biggest people, the richest people, they cannot believe what China gets away with. 
They said, we can't believe it. Then when I announced I was running for president, they called, well, we really didn't mean that. They didn't like it. They didn't know this was going to happen. But in the good old days, they would tell me, we don't believe it. Your government is stupid. But now they deny they've ever said that. On, on staffing, how would you run a government to make it more effective? Uh, what would be your criteria in choosing the senior administrators? Track record, um, great competence, love of what they're doing, how they're getting along with people, references. I mean, no different than when you're running a company, how you hire top people. It would be no different. Uh, the government, I, you need people with heart also. You know, it's probably the one thing you need in government that they don't have in business quite as much. But you need, but some, some do. <laughs> but not a lot. But you need people that are truly, truly capable. And you need, and I think so much has to do with past history. How have they done? How has it all worked out? You understand what I mean by that perhaps better than anybody. Um, and we have to get the best people. We can no longer be so politically correct. You know, we do things today, we're, we're so politically correct. People are afraid to walk, they're afraid to talk. They can't speak. They're afraid they're gonna say the wrong word and they'll be shunned from society. Don't worry, it only lasts for about a week if that happens, not that bad. <laughs> but we have to stop being so politically correct. We need to get the best and the finest and if we don't, will be in trouble for a long period of time, and maybe never come out of it. I, I honestly believe, and I'm not saying this because it's myself, this is the last time, this is gonna be the last election we have a chance to make this country great again, to really make it wealthy again, make it strong again, make it, you know, all of the things that we wanna see, we have to have. But I really believe this is the most important election that we've been involved in, in you know, for many, 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 many years, many decades. And because it's going, it's going down. Uh, the Supreme Court justices that I told you about before, um, I mean, if they put certain people onto the Supreme Court, our country is going to be a whole different country. We're gonna be a large scale version of Venezuela. We're gonna be a totally different deal. And this is the last chance that, in my opinion, our country has to really get better, to get well. And I just think this election is so important, not because of me, but because of the ideas, the ideas that we have, the ideas that we need to do what we have to do. But I think it's gonna be a very, very important election. And that's why we're seeing such enthusiasm. You know, we go make a speech, John, and, and we have people showing up, 25,000 people show up and 30,000 people. And we announced, we announced one day, we had one uh, in Pensacola the other day we had this massive tens of thousands of people showed up. We announced like a day and a half before the speech on, on Twitter. We don't even take ads. Uh, people want to see great things happen for this country. People really love this country. The people of this country really love this country. Even other countries want to see great things happen because it's so important. So I, I just think this is going to be the most important election that we've had for many, many decades. And I'm not sure you're going to have a second chance at it. Donald, on jobs, uh, what industries do you expect would benefit from your economic plan to create high paying jobs going forward? Well, I think H&R Block would be a disaster. Okay. Because we're simplifying, you're not going to have a, how about people, they go with the, the, the tax, it's so complicated. You need 180 IQ to understand it. And people that frankly are making a small amount of money, they have to go and they have to have their tax returns done by people. And, and by the way, when they're done, you'll have 10 different tax people and you'll have 10 different answers to the same person. It, the whole thing is crazy. So that would be one industry that wouldn't do well. Uh, but I think almost all industries, I can tell you an industry that will do well and an industry that we can use, and I know prices are low now, but when prices go up is the energy industry. We have amazing people in that industry and they are just being decimated. They are being absolutely 
decimated. And um, energy is, you know, so important. And we found out because of new technology, whether it's fracking or many other things, we're sitting on top. Our land has turned out to be, we have more than just about anybody in the world. Our land has turned out to be so valuable because of what's underneath it. We have to be careful. We have to be very environmentally sound. That's very important. But it's incredible when you look at what's happened in the last five years. We can be self-sufficient, which we have to be. Otherwise, we'll be stuck in the Middle East forever. And we have to get out of that war. We have to knock out ISIS. I didn't want to be in that war, but I wasn't a politician. Nobody really cared. But I didn't want to be in the war, but we have no choice. The way they got out was bad to get out so quickly and not leave anybody behind. ISIS developed, we have to knock out ISIS. You see the atrocities they committed. Yesterday, I guess it was 22 or 24 people hung from racks of a slaughterhouse, like a slaughterhouse, and then throats cut. I mean, can you imagine this? Nobody's ever heard of things like this before. And then we talk about waterboarding. It's, uh, it's an incredible thing. No, it's incredible. We're not playing on the same playing field. But if you looked at what the atrocities committed just yesterday with the with the meat hooks, uh, we have no choice but to totally decimate ISIS. We have to do it. We have to do it rapidly. We have no choice. And, and then we have to get back to rebuilding our country, folks. We have to rebuild the infrastructure of our country. We have to rebuild our country because it's a mess. Hmm. Uh, last question. If you, if, you were, if you were to advise the Fed, what would you advise them to do regarding interest rate policy? Well, as a real estate person, I always like low interest rates, of course. But I think what's going to happen is you're going to have them until January 1st, because Obama wants to go, he wants to play golf, and he wants to leave. He doesn't want to have any stock market disruptions. And I think they're, and I said, I think the Fed is being totally controlled politically. Uh, they're not raising rates. And they're being controlled politically. I think they're going to be low till, you know, I'm going to be, I don't even know if they're going to have a raise, but they're going to have, they're going to be low till the end of the year. I don't think Obama, he wants to go out. I mean, shouldn't be working this way. They not shouldn't even be discussing it. Martin may or may not disagree with me. I just think that it's a, I think it's a terrible thing that's happening because we're doing it for political. I believe the Fed is very political. It's become very political, like many other groups in this country, beyond anything I would have ever thought possible. And so I think you're going to have low interest rates uh, till the end of the year, maybe no increase at all. And the market will stay artificially high. And then we're going to have to see what happens after that. But I think it's, uh, they're, not, they're not doing the right job. Now, with all of that being said, you know, all my life I like low interest rates. And can you imagine? Because I'm doing this, I can't even take advantage of it, but that's okay. But uh, I will say it's, it's very, it's become, in my opinion, the Fed has become extremely political. Uh, I don't think they would do, I really believe if it was a political decision or the right decision, they're going to go with a political decision every single time. Well, uh, that concludes our fireside chat. Once again, on behalf of myself and everyone here, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.